And we're recording, and I'm really excited about my interview today with Lincoln Cannon. He's the, or he's one of the founders of the Mormon Transhumanist Association, and um, just a really, really smart um, guy. Is, um, is that a decent introduction for you? And and, and do you mind giving a, uh, um, do you mind giving your your introduction? Sure. Yeah, I am one of the founders of the Mormon Transhumanist Association. There were 14 of us, and I served as the first president and CEO of the organization for 10 years. Then I stepped down and we've uh, put in place some new presidents and CEOs since that time. And I, of course, continue to support them and participate in the association. And, I, and I'm flattered that you think that I'm a smart guy. Hopefully I won't uh, disappoint. <laughs> um, cool, yeah, uh, yeah, so, uh, so, so first, uh, well, anyone that anyone that uses big words, um, then, then then my question is always well, and and your words aren't necessarily big; they're just um, like uh, like post post college vocabulary um, kind of words uh, that that you use sometimes. And and whenever I hear someone using a word like that, then I always think, okay, are are they did they just memorize like like fifty like smart words or? Or do they really know what they're talking about? And then, and then the really cool, uh, the really cool thing about you is if is if you're describing something that requires a lot of really specific vocabulary, then you're uh, you're very willing to like. Uh, um, and, and somebody says, oh well, what does? Um, and, and I can't remember a, a, a like smart word that you use, uh, but but you're very willing to like like break it down and say um, break it down like like look at it from a different perspective. Um, say it in like three or four different, uh, say it in like three or four different ways. So, uh, um, so, so, so anyway, um, like, like whenever I hear someone like using a, a bunch of like words that I've never heard of before or don't understand, that, um, that, then that's kind of the thing, that's kind of the thing that goes off in my head is saying, okay, well, let me just, let me just test this guy to see if he's like just repeating stuff or yeah, if he's actually um, smart. So, great. Do it uh, <laughs> well, uh, well, well, actually, I, I already did that when we uh, when we met years ago, and um, and and anyway, um, um, so so hopefully you're still the same. Hopefully you're not like in my category two of people um, up now. Um, we'll find out. So. <laughs> um, cool, cool. So, um, so, so, can you uh, for, for for people that um, have never heard about um, transhumanism or the Mormon Transhumanism Association? Can you? Um, can you talk about both of those and what they are? Yeah. Transhumanism, I define that as the ethical, well, advocacy for the ethical use of technology to expand human abilities. A uh, couple of key words there being advocacy and ethical. When people first hear about transhumanism, oftentimes they just think about technological cheerleading to make humans faster, stronger, smarter, something like that. But transhumanism goes beyond just cheerleading. It's about both the risks and the opportunities. So that's where the ethical part comes in. And then if you're concerned about the risks and opportunities and you're just quiet about it, you're still not a transhumanist because advocacy is also part of it. So to be a, uh, to be a full transhumanist, you need to be interested in both the risks and opportunities and the ethics of using technology to enhance our abilities. And then you need to be an advocate for it saying, there are ethical challenges here. We need to do the right thing, but I'm optimistic that we can do the right thing. So let's go do it. So that's kind of what a transhumanist is. Somebody who is optimistic about the potential of technology to make us better people in many ways, to make our society and our world better in many ways, but who also recognizes real risks in the process and wants to work through those, mitigate those risks, and then achieve uh, with others, those really beautiful possibilities that we aspire to. So that's transhumanism. Oh, Mormon and, then, uh, and, and and sorry, let me uh, let me ask just kind of a couple of follow up uh, questions with transhumanism. So 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 uh, I read um, I read about half of Kurzweil's uh, Kurzweil's book, and um, and and Kurzweil's like kind of a transhumanist, um, mm -hmm. right? Um, so. Uh, um, so, so can you talk about transhumanism in terms of well, well, Kurzweil, um, Kurzweil, I, uh, um, Kurzweil predicted that twenty forty five would be the point where uh, machines get smarter than uh, smarter than humans, and then after that point, they'll get like way exponentially smarter, um, um, so much to the so much to the point that we don't really like 
uh, uh, we can't really conceptualize now what's going to happen. Um, and then, um, and then two, I think I, I think he did something like freezing his dad's brain so that maybe he can bring like his dad back at some point. And so, so, so can you talk about transhumanism in in relation to like uh, in relation to those two things about Kurzweil? And, and, and are those like typical? Is, is Kurzweil kind of this fringe uh, transhumanist or, or, or what, what exactly? Yeah, yeah. I'll talk about both of those things. So um, the first thing you mentioned is that, is that uh, Ray Kurzweil is an advocate of a kind of transhumanism that we call singularitarianism. And that's a huge mouthful, I'm sorry. It's the idea that uh, technological change is accelerating. And that if it continues to accelerate um, indefinitely, that it will eventually be accelerating so fast and impacts will be so dramatic and so broad that people like you and I now, ordinary humans, will no longer be able to predict or control or perhaps even fully cognize the consequences of the pace of technological change. And so singularitarians call that point in time the technological singularity. And as you mentioned, Kurzweil has predicted that something like that may start around the year 2045. And there's various perspectives among singularitarians about what that entails for humanity. There are some singularitarians who think that artificial intelligence will take off and surpass humanity and leave us behind. And there are some transhumanists who think that we will integrate with our technology and we will advance kind of complementarily with artificial intelligence. Uh, Ray is, he doesn't personally identify as a transhumanist. He prefers the word singularitarian to describe him, but he's more of the second kind of, of singularitarian. He does believe that we will continue to integrate our lives, our bodies, our minds, our communities with our technology and that artificial intelligence and human intelligence will remain complementary and progress together. But he does very much uh, believe in and aspire to a sort of technological singularity. In contrast, I'm, I don't identify as a singularitarian. I do think we are seeing in many ways accelerating technological change. I also think we're seeing accelerating complexity in the areas where we apply technology. And I think those often off offset each other. And when they don't offset each other, what we see is that sometimes technology accelerates super fast in one area, but then in the same way that accelerated it in that area, once it kind of permeates its applicability there, it, it, it decelerates at an exponential rate as well, our progress in that area. But very often, and Ray Kurzweil points this out, that deceleration in one area is picked up by acceleration in yet another area that supersedes it. So I, I can't say with high confidence that Ray is wrong about a technological singularity. I'm open-minded to the possibility, but I don't, I don't assertively believe in the technological singularity. I think it's an interesting idea worthy of serious consideration because of how momentous it would be in the future of humanity. We, we would be, we're, we are approaching a time with really big consequences if he's right. And we already know there's already big consequences to technological change today. What if it becomes even faster and even bigger changes um, at, in shorter periods of time? So it's a big deal if, he, if he's right and it's worth considering. The second thing you brought up was uh, basically cryonics of, of various forms. You mentioned that Ray may, be, may have preserved his father cryonically. I, I don't know the details of that. I know he is a, a proponent of cryonics. And cryonics is an interesting thing that is practiced by uh, quite a few transhumanists or is advocated by quite a few transhumanists. And the, and the basic idea of cryonics is that it may be possible to preserve our brain and body. Some people just do preserve the brains, some people the whole body, and use it in the future as a sort of database to reconstruct the structure of our brain and body to resuscitate us at a time when whatever killed us can be fixed. 
And of course, at a time when we have the technological capacity to re-engineer brains and bodies in a sufficient way for a human to you know, be there alive, and, which we can't do today. We're not even close. But uh, biotechnology is advancing rapidly. There are some really quite amazing advances toward that possibility, but we have a long ways to go. And so it's, it's, a, it's a speculative technology, it's a speculative practice. And there's more than one way to implement it. Some people, historically, they just tried to freeze the bodies that produced lots of damage in the brain and body. So it reduced the amount of useful information that you would ultimately be able to get out of that brain and body. But th there's been a lot of progress in our ability to preserve brains and bodies. And the latest techniques using a vitrification process actually turn the brain and, um, and, and the entire body, if you choose to do the whole body, into something approximating what we might think of as like glass. And it preserves very, very fine details. In fact, one company called Nectone, which is kind of the leading company in this new vitrification process, um, has done some, some research and, and claims, and I don't, I don't know the details of how well they've been able to uh, demonstrate this, but they claimed that they've preserved details in such a way that even expert neurologists haven't been able to tell the difference between the details that they've preserved and a living brain. So um, I, again, I'm not an expert on, on that particular aspect of it, but there's a lot of money going into that space. There are a lot of transhumanist aspirations directed at that space. And I actually think that it's worthy of, of that aspiration. I think that uh, it, it's likely a, a useful thing to preserve as much information about ourselves as we can if we aspire to a future in which we um, might be able to be resuscitated and have whatever killed us fixed and live again with our family and friends and uh, appreciate the things that we currently appreciate about life when we're healthy and happy. So yeah, there are transhumanists that um, are, are singularitarians. There are transhumanists that are cryonicists. And I, I, I personally plan to practice something like uh, cryonics um, when my time comes, assuming that assuming that we don't have something better that will keep me alive without having to go into a preservation process. But um, I'm on the other one on singularitarianism. I'm I'm open minded to it, but um, also uh, uh, somewhat skeptical that there will be some kind of infinite um, explosion of information and, and intelligence in, in the year 2045. I, I think that that might not sufficiently account for the complexity of our world, but I might be wrong. Huh, and that's uh, that's a really interesting uh, that's a really interesting way of, uh, of putting it. So 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 I think those are kind of like the two most sensational parts of, of transhumanism. Um, and, and it sounds like the thing that really excites you about uh, transhumanism isn't those uh, isn't those like two sensational parts that I brought that I brought up. So so what uh, what is it that like like about the transhumanism like like movement? Is like the most uh, like for you is the most uh, is the most exciting, um, um, compelling. Like like where where do you spend most of your like like um, brain time on the transhumanism um, on the transhumanism movement? My favorite part about transhumanism is the practical approach, advocating a practical approach to improving human intelligence and applying it in ways that will make us more creative and more compassionate. And that might seem a little bit strange to think that technology could make us more creative or more compassionate, but I, I trust that it can because technology makes us more intelligent and greater intelligence broadens our ability to do all kinds of things, including creative and compassionate acts. So I would more than anything love to see human potential expand into acts of creation and compassion that right now we can only barely imagine. I would love to live in a super intelligent future where we, humanity, rises to what we might call divine potential. When we imagine the gods or when we imagine God and we imagine their creative and compassionate potentials or potential, depending on the religious tr tradition we're talking about, those imaginations that we have that have shaped our 
human civilization for thousands of years, shaped our hearts in many ways, and I'm speaking collectively, collectively of humanity here, wouldn't that be amazing and inspiring and worth pursuing to be able to take those virtues? And I'm talking about the virtue. I'm not just talking about Zeus with the lightning bolt type gods here. I'm talking about the best of our imaginations and inspirations and revelations of the gods or of God. Wouldn't it be beautiful and amazing to be able to live those and exemplify those and immerse ourselves in those in ways that right now we can just start to imagine. That's the thing that interests me most about transhumanism is taking a practical approach to you know, the greatest imaginings of human potential. And if along the way, which is likely for most of us given the current state of the world, but could change with advances in science and technology, if along the way I need to die, you need to die, my friends and family need to die, well, I'm hoping that there are ways that we can preserve sufficient information about ourselves to facilitate our return. And some people might ask, well, what if you don't do that? Are you just gone forever? I actually don't think so. I, 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 I suspect that there will be ways of, let's just say mining time and space to get that information that we need eventually but I suspect it will be a lot harder to do if we don't make a concerted effort to save information about ourselves. So things like family history, genealogy, photos, um, recordings, audio, video, and yes, brain and bo body preservation. I think all of those can contribute to preserving enough information about us to facilitate an eventual resuscitation or from a religious perspective, what we might call resurrection and help us and our family and friends, the people we love, because none of this matters without the relationships with the people we love. It really doesn't. Maybe this will help us get into that world that our religions have so often imagined and told us to be imagining and aspiring to. Maybe it will help us contribute to realizing those visions in practical reality. So that the, the, the whole cryonics thing, it does contribute to what I would, like to participate in, but it isn't itself the end goal. The end goal is living in relationship with people I love and experiencing more of life, more deeply, more broadly, and observing and enjoying watching my friends and family do the same. Huh, that's, a, uh, that's a really cool uh, that's a really cool answer, and um, and and it brings up um, some um, some other questions that I have. But um, but but let's um, let's skip forward to uh, Mormon uh, the Mormon Transhumanist Association, and then uh, um, can can you, can you talk about like what um, is, is the Mormon Transhumanist Association similar to Singularitarianism um, in that it's like a branch uh, a branch of transhumanism, or uh, or is it uh, or is it something else? Like like what exactly is the Mormon Transhumanist Association? Yeah, so most transhumanists are secular and uh, most secular transhumanists are agnostic and, and a minority actually identify as atheist. So religion's not a big deal among most transhumanists, but among a minority, and it's a growing minority of transhumanists, we are religious. And religious transhumanists identify with various religious traditions, uh, both traditional ones and more emerging type religions. Some people have founded their own religions and called them transhumanist religions. But the fastest growing groups of religious transhumanists are groups that are associated with traditional religions. And the oldest transhumanist organization for religious transhumanists of the traditional sort is the Mormon Transhumanist Association. Uh, we, we, founded, we were founded in 2006, as I mentioned before, there were 14 of us that founded it. And after founding the organization, we reached out to the world's largest group of secular transhumanists. At the time it was called the World Transhumanist Association. Today, they, are, they changed their name in the intervening years and they now um, call themselves Humanity Plus. We reached out to them and said, hey, would you like to affiliate with us? They debated it among their leadership, got back to us and said, yeah, we'll affiliate with you guys. So we affiliated with them back also in 2006. And 
then over time, we've also helped other religious transhumanists develop their organizations. Many Mormon transhumanists helped found the Christian Transhumanist Association. I think that was 2012, if I remember right, thereabouts when that was founded. Um, I'm a board member there. I, I continue to be a board member at the Mormon Transhumanist Association. And what we do, so, so yes, we, you could consider religious transhumanism as a segment or a kind of transhumanism, like we were talking about singularitarianism before. Religious transhumanists, some, some religious transhumanists are singularitarians, so there's overlap. Some are not, such as I. Um, and among religious transhumanists, there are some who are big fans of cryonics, for example, such as I, and others that aren't so much fans of cryonics. So there's diversity among all of these groups and in, in what, they, what they like best about transhumanism. But religious transhumanists in general, we bring with us a concern not only for the secular aspects of transhumanism, we, we really appreciate those and advocate those and love talking with our secular uh, friends, our secular transhumanist brothers and sisters about those, but we also tend to deeply care about an aesthetic side uh, that comes from our religious traditions and that inspires us and shapes, shapes our approach to transhumanism on multiple levels. It shapes the way we feel about it. It shapes our, our ethical deliberations in regards to transhumanism. It, it shapes our motivation for sharing transhumanism with other people. And, you know, as most people know, Mormons are pretty missionary oriented. Well, as it turns out, Mormon transhumanists are pretty mi missionary oriented as well. So, you know, this religious transhumanism thing is a way for us to share our approach to transhumanism in our particular way uh, that, that reflects our values in a more complete way than secular transhumanism would do on its own. Okay, and um, and and kind of a uh, well, um, I have I have two questions for you. It's um, it's it's mostly because like whenever anyone says or uh, whenever anyone is um, hears about Mor the Mormon Transhumanist Association, then they always say this. Like like I've read through a whole bunch of message boards, and I'm like, uh, um, and. And it's really interesting. Like every time I, every time I've heard you respond to this, um, you, you respond to it very respectfully. Like it's uh, um, kind of like it's the first time you've heard um, you've heard someone ask ask this question. But it's it's like um, it's like the question that every single you, you probably already fielded this question um, like like a thousand a thousand or more times already. But um, uh, but but my real question is is why do people keep asking this question? So um, so so. so um, so, so, so it's two. Um, my question is two questions. Why do people like keep asking this question? And then the question that everyone asks is, "Oh, Mormon Transhumanism Association isn't that a paradox?" Um, yeah. So, so could um, um, could you could you answer those two questions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I'll I'll answer I'll answer the question first, and then I'll answer your second about why people keep asking it. And that's actually a great follow up question. Thank you for asking that. The reason that Mormon transhumanism is not a paradox, and it's not, not remotely a paradox, is because Mormonism and transhumanism have remarkably similar aspirations regarding the future and remarkably similar metaphysics. So in Mormonism, the central purpose of our theology is for humanity to become like God. In Mormon scripture, we read that the work and glory of God is to bring about the immortality and eternal life of humanity. And we read elsewhere in Mormon scripture that elaborates that that entails becoming gods ourselves, uh, the same way as all other gods have done before. And that's a quote from the founding prophet of Mormonism, Joseph Smith. So, this central idea of Mormonism that humanity can and should become like God has a strong resemblance to this idea from transhumanism that humanity can and should become superhumanity. Now there's some, some variations in the aesthetic, of course. In Mormonism, what it means to be like God is not just to be powerful. It's not just to be intelligent, but it is to be intelligent and powerful. That's part of it. 
Mormon, Mormons would then add, hey, the chief characteristic of God is exemplified by Jesus Christ, and that is compassion or love. And so when we imagine the kind of superhumanity that we aspire to become, we say, sure, intelligent and powerful and creative and all of that, but we aspire to do it in a charitable and compassionate and loving way. And even a, a super loving way, a super compassionate way to match our intel, you know, super intelligent capacity. So that's that's one part there is that the purpose of Mormonism and transhumanism are remarkably complementary, or even the same purpose. They might be describing the same purpose in just different words. One set of words being religious, one set of words being secular, and we might be able and Mormon transhumanists would, would argue, we can, we can interpret the one into the other and help people understand that they are the same purpose. Another part of the reason why Mormonism and transhumanism are not you know, antagonistic, that it's not a paradox, is that Mormons are philosophically materialists. And that doesn't mean we like money, although Mormons are pretty good at saving money. That, that's, that's a actually a, 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 I think a respectable Mormon trait. But what I mean by philosophical materialists is that our cosmology asserts that everything is material. Even spirit or mind is ultimately material. Our scriptures say that it's more refined or more pure. So you can only see it maybe with purer eyes. And that what comes from scripture written 200 years ago. I like to think that if that scripture were written today, it would talk about it more in terms of something like maybe information. And so in Mormonism, we, we don't look for supernatural in the sense of nature negating ways of explaining phenomena. Our sense of how phenomena work in the world is, and, and is a natural one, although we acknowledge there are many things about the natural world that we don't yet understand. And so that's perfectly compatible with a pretty typical transhumanist perspective on the cosmos. That we live in a world of, of, you know, a material world, matter and energy are two forms of the same thing. And that really resonates with most Mormons um, because our religion pretty much teaches the same, or at least an analogous idea that's easy to interpret into the same thing. Uh, along those lines also, Mormon, Mormonism teaches that heaven is not a place far away that we'll maybe go to when we're dead. In Mormonism, heaven is what the earth will become. Heaven is what the earth will become and it will be the place that the gods that we become inhabit. So it's not an escapist religion. It's a religion about transformation, transformation of our bodies into better bodies, more robust bodies, more intelligent bodies, our minds to be more creative and compassionate and our world, the earth into a, into a more what we call it paradisical in our scriptures, but a more, you know, a better world, a more beautiful world, a renewed world. And it's not about negating any of that. It's about inhabiting all of that, inhabiting these bodies, inhabiting this world and making them all better. And it's a communal religion. When Joseph Smith, our founding prophet, talked about religion or about heaven, he said, you know, heaven is going to be the same sociality that we enjoy right now it will just be coupled with eternal glory. And, you know, what does that mean? Well, I don't know for sure what that would mean, but it's like that's something better. It's that super intelligence, maybe we could say, that's beyond current human capacity. But it's not a negation of this world. It's not a negation of our relationships. It's a continuation of them. And so in, when we die in Mormonism, we don't go to what we would call heaven right away. In Mormonism, when you die, you, you become a spirit again. And again, remember, spirit's material in Mormonism. So you're not immaterial. You're, whatever spirit is, it's still around. It's still material and it still exists. But then in Mormonism, to go to heaven, you have to then be resurrected physically. And you're resurrected physically to this world, to this earth, which is ultimately glorified and becomes the place where God resides. So... In transhumanism, likewise, there's this idea that, hey, um, death is a bad thing. Um, maybe we can bring the dead back through things like cryonics. Maybe we can become um, capable of, of 
of being somewhat immune to death and maybe we can eventually live in a world where it's harder to stay dead than alive and maybe we can use our our knowledge and our power from science and technology to eradicate poverty maybe we can live in a world of great abundance maybe we can use it our science and technology to solve the problems of like global warming and other environmental crises maybe we can do something about all of this and maybe the super intelligent humans or superhumans of the future will abide in a world that would be indistinguishable from what many people might imagine heaven to be. And so there again, there's a strong complementarity between a Mormon vision of the future and a transhumanist vision of the future. And, and so why do people always ask if there's so much in common between Mormonism and transhumanism, why do people keep asking about this? Why do people keep just assuming that they are antagonistic to each other. And I think there's a few reasons. Number one, most people think that transhumanism implies atheism and that's actually false. And um, I've actually done a lot of work to demonstrate why actually transhumanism coherently and consistently applied actually entails theism, belief or faith in God. And I call that the new God argument. And there's some technicalities about it. It's an interesting argument. We could maybe get in that later if it interests you. But basically the point being that you don't have to be an atheist to be a transhumanist. And moreover, there might be reasons why transhumanists actually should have faith in God or something approximating God. They might wanna call it by a different name. They might wanna call it super intelligence or something like that. Um, another reason why people might think that Mormonism and transhumanism are incompatible is that there are a lot of conservative Christian religions, and some Mormons are quite conservative. So we we you know we have it's not an accident that we have the, the reputation of sometimes being you know among the conservative religious persons. But there's a large large group of non-Mormon religious conservatives that absolutely hate transhumanism. They think it's from the devil, it's evil, and that anybody who participates in it clearly has the mark of the beast or um, is worshiping de devils or you know you can imagine where they go from there in contrast though despite despite that reality if you approach the average mormon on the street and you ask that mormon about transhumanism the most likely response you'll get is well i'm not sure what transhumanism is if you then explain it to them without poisoning the well and saying, it's this evil thing. Well, if you say it's this evil thing, of course they're gonna think it's evil. But if you just explain it to them neutrally, most of the time what you'll get is an expression of cautious interest. It's like, oh, well, that's interesting. And sometimes what you'll get is, oh, wow, that actually sounds really cool. And in fact, I have these ideas in my religion that are really similar to that. And those people end up often becoming Mormon transhumanists, of course. And then a minority, and this really is the smallest of these three groups I'm describing, a minority will act like fundamentalist Christians from these other traditions I've described and go, oh, that sounds like the mark of the beast, satanic stuff. But they, it, they are far fewer among Mormons. And the reason for that is that in Mormonism, as I've pointed out, we teach that humanity has divine potential, literally. We believe it literally, we work at it literally. And so when you tell a Mormon, hey, maybe science and technology can be part of the way that we work towards achieving that. Well, I'm, you know, our religion is not incompatible with that. We, we see the world through materialist, philosophically materialist lens. We think that earth should become heaven. We think that our physical bodies should become immortal, okay. I'll consider it and maybe I'll get excited about it. So people keep asking about that paradox because um, they think that transhumanism applies atheism and they're wrong. And they think that Mormons are typical Christian conservatives and they're wrong. Both of those are inaccurate assumptions. Well, uh, that's uh, uh, that's interesting. And th uh, thanks for uh, thanks for breaking that down. So, so, so I kind of want to um, you. Um, you basically, well, um, a lot of, um, a lot of times I think that, 
Um, I, um, I think that people think that the stuff that's predicted uh, or I, 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 in like the Bible to happen, like like the resurrection, that um, that basically like God will wave his hand and then a bunch of stuff will happen. Um, and and one of the cool things about um, one of the cool things about Mormonism is that um, it 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 seems like Mormon uh, it seems like Mormonism takes a like more active part, saying, "Hey, well, uh, whatever whatever God says is going to happen, we're going to be like part of of doing this." And, and and you described um, you described that with with basically resurrection that that possibly um, possibly the resurrection could be um, uh, um, could be just like an extension of the transhuman transhumanism um, movement and, uh, and and one of my questions is uh, um, do you uh, do you strongly feel that it's going to be that way or do you think that well it it, it could be like like God God, God could wave his um, hand and then everyone just gets re resurrected or it could be more of a uh, uh, more of more of a thing where God's saying hey well uh, now uh, now it's your turn uh, um, uh, these are basically the next steps so so now it's time for the resurrection you guys um, go ahead um, uh, um, and and then also um, and then also um, can you kind of talk about some stuff within Mormonism because because I think um, I think like even with the the very uh, uh, one of the very, uh, very first like big things that happened in Mormonism is is the migration to to Utah. Uh, that, uh, that 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 wasn't something where, where where God waved His hand and then everyone just appeared in Utah. That was a just a whole bunch of work. And so um, and so so one of the very big uh, foundational events basically had like all of the Mormonism uh, all of the Mormons uh, working together to make this um, huge thing um, happen of basically trans transplanting a. A, a big population of, of folks like all the way across the country when uh, when, when it wasn't easy at all to um, um, to do that. So 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 can you um, can you talk about um, both of those things? Yeah, happy to. Mormonism certainly emphasizes the Christian idea that faith without works is dead, and that that idea comes from, of course, the Bible, the Epistle of James, where James points out this idea that faith without works is dead. And he gives some examples. He says, if you see a person who's hungry or a person who's naked, it's not enough to just say, be fed or be clothed. It doesn't work that way. And he's, and I think he's almost saying this tongue in cheek, right? He's like, he's saying, if you really think that way, you're not very smart because what we have to do, and James points out, is we actually have to give them clothing. We actually act, actually have to give them food and that it's through those works that we express our faith our faith that they can be fed our faith that they they can be clothed so faith without works is dead so christianity then has faith that the world can become a better place christianity has faith that the sad can be consoled that the sick can be healed, that the dead can be raised. And in fact, what did Jesus tell his disciples? Well, he actually told his disciples to go out and console the sad. He told them to go out and heal the sick. And yes, so many Christians forget this. Jesus tells his disciples in the New Testament to raise the dead. And how many Christians are taking that seriously today? I'd say not enough of us are. So, Jesus expresses this, this call to a practical faith, to do something about our faith. And then that's echoed by all the other authors of the, of the New Testament. And of course, in unique Mormon scripture, like the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, those ideas are echoed even further, that faith without works is dead. We should be participating in this work that God does. And in Mormon scripture, as I already mentioned earlier, the work of God is to bring about human immortality and eternal life. And if we have faith in that work, if we have faith in that potential, we should participate in it. Otherwise, our, our faith is vain, as James would have put it in the New Testament. So um, when it comes to these aspirations of the future, you know, of living in a paradisical world that's been renewed, of, of living in a world where we have been resurrected 
or transfigured from mortality to immortality, living in a world that's beyond present notions of poverty and enmity, we have all of these visions painted for us in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon. What are we doing to achieve them? Are we only praying or are we doing something? And if we are doing something, what? And so Mormons do stuff, right? You already mentioned that Mormons, uh, we, you know, when we had problems building uh, Zion in the Eastern United States, we packed up, got in wagons and we went to the West. In fact, we thought we were leaving the United States. We thought we were going maybe to Mexico, maybe to start our own country, state of Deseret or something. Turns out that the United States Army had a different thing in mind years later and came and marched on what would become Utah and we joined the, the um, country again at some point. But, you know, we wanted to build our Zion. We wanted to build the foundations of what we hoped would become a better place to live and ultimately a better world to live in and ultimately a heaven. And um, when it comes to the work for the dead, well, Mormons have amassed more family history and genealogical data and information than probably um, all of the other groups who work in that space combined. And, and that might sound like an exaggeration, but I'm pretty sure that's right. You can go check on, check on that on the internet. Um, Mormons founded Ancestry.com. Um, Mormons run a, a, a major um, family history genealogy service called uh, Family Search. And these services are treasure troves of information about the history of humanity, about all of our ancestors. And so your average mainstream Mormon will say, well, we're collecting all of this information about the dead because we need to do temple work for them. And what we mean by temple work is that we need to do our religious rituals for them so that they have an opportunity, they're not forced, to choose to participate in heaven with us if they would like to. I often talk about that with my Mormon friends and say, well, why would it ever just be about the ritual? What if this is just the beginning of the work? What if collecting the names and the dates is just keying the database? What if we have to get all of the data that goes along with those keys? What if we need to learn what they were actually like? What if our hearts really need to turn to them fully and immersively and we need to get to know them? And what if that process of getting to know them fully and immersively leads to their actual resurrection through our works? And there are early Mormon prophets like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young who talked about what they called um, ordinances of the church or rituals, if you will, of transfiguration and resurrection that we would perform for each other and for the dead. Joseph Smith said that there would be an ordinance or a ritual that we would perform to transfigure mortal humans into immortal humans. And Brigham Young, his successor, the one who led the Mormon pioneers from the Eastern United States out into the West, he said that there would be a ritual or an ordinance that we would use to raise the dead and resurrect them. In other words, the early Mormon prophets explicitly taught this idea that we should anticipate participating in this work of God to bring about human immortality and to bring about human eternal life. Now, of course, there's more to the mission than just raising the dead. Um, important aspects of Mormonism, in fact, the focus really of most of the effort of Mormonism would be on things like preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and helping each other and building strong communities and families. And those are the most important things to most Mormons, I think rightly so, because practically they're things that we can do really well with the technology and knowledge and social structures that we have today. And also because frankly, raising the dead doesn't matter if we're all jerks and if we hate each other and we don't wanna to live together. So we do need to have our priority strength. Compassion, which is the you know, love, which is the core principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ, really does need to come first. So I think Mormonism is right to focus on that first. But that doesn't mean we don't care about the other things. The church's mission is to what the church calls do the work for the dead. And we have temples all over the world where people are engaged in that. I don't think we fully 
realize the potential of that work. I think our, our vision is just, you know, I'm talking about your average mainstream Mormon here. I think our vision of what we can do with all that information ultimately and where it could lead us is still nascent and growing. But I do think that over time we'll become more aware of the potential built in to the work that we've been doing now for 200 years. So yes, um, to answer your question, uh, Mormons care a great deal about realizing prophecies, about participating in the realization of prophecies. And we do a lot of work um, to, to that end. Cool, that's a, uh, that's a, that's a very, very, very good answer. So, um, so going back, uh, you, uh, you said something, you, you mentioned um, aesthetics. And I'm pretty sure you weren't talking about like like hair and makeup. Um, so so um, so can you can you explain aesthetics in in terms of of what you were talking about earlier? Yeah, I would describe religion as primarily an aesthetic concern. Lots of people, when they think about religion, they think about superstitious beliefs and doctrines. I'm talking about atheists or secular people who think about religion, right? They think about superstitious beliefs or doctrines, and I think they're missing the point. Religion is not primarily about beliefs or doctrines, those or ethical rules even. Those are all outcroppings of something that religion is more fundamentally about. And what religion is most fundamentally about is aesthetics. And not just, as you pointed out, aesthetics in a superficial like cosmetic sense. We're talking about aesthetics on a deep sense aesthetics that move us, aesthetics that we feel. And in religion, religion is about communal aesthetics or shared aesthetics. And I would say that anything that provokes, any practice that provokes a community to a strenuous mood is religion by definition. That's my definition of what a religion is. It's any practice that provokes a communal strenuous mood. So while some aesthetic communities might explicitly identify as a religion, others might not, and they might actually be a misrecognized religion. They may be functioning as a religion or as a pseudo religion without being fully aware of it or without fully acknowledging it to themselves or others. So aesthetics, when, I, when I'm using the word aesthetics here, it's, it, it is related to those superficial appearances but it's much deeper and broader. It's, it's, a, it's a feeling, it's a sense. It's when you're in a concert hall and you all feel this rush together. That is a shared aesthetic. And religion has demonstrated over thousands of years that it is unparalleled in its ability to create and use shared aesthetics in powerful ways that move groups of people in powerful ways. Now that doesn't mean it's always good. Religion has done horrible things over human history. Horrible, terrible, maybe the worst things that have ever happened in human history have been done because of religious influence. But that's not the full story, of course. The anti-religious would like to focus on those negative things. The full story also has to include the other side. Religious influence and religious aesthetics have also inspired and motivated and provoked some of the most sublime communal acts in human history as well. And so you have this powerful social technology, religion, that is shaping humanity. And from a transhumanist perspective, I would argue that it's our duty to recognize how powerful religion is and use that power in the most ethical ways possible to pursue and motivate and inspire the most beautiful human futures that we can and work against the dark ones, the oppressive ones, the superstitious ones, because religion can also make those very powerful if we don't work against them. And, um, and, and that's really interesting. And that's uh, like, I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask you about that because I, I, I saw an interview where, that you were in where you, where, where you had the quote, religion is a social technology. And you, and you, kind, of, uh, you kind of mentioned that. Um, I'm, 
Um, I I have kind of a couple questions on that. Uh, one, what uh, what is what is strenuous in terms of religion? Uh, because like like sometimes it feels strenuous to go to church, but I'm but I'm pretty sure you're not talking about uh, I'm I'm pretty sure you're not talking about that. And um, and and you talk about uh, you talk about kind of the uh, the power of that. And, and then if if religion is a social technology, you make a good point that um, that. Um, tr transhumanists, like in general, should um, should recognize, hey, well, this is one of the most powerful. Um, this is one of the most powerful technologies that exists out there. So, um, so, so, kind of a couple additional questions on that is why is religion such a um, why is religion such a powerful social technology, and um, is it is it something that um, someone like super smart could say, okay, well. We need to we need to do this, so we need to build a religion to accomplish this like big, uh, big thing. Like, um, like like for example, going um, going to Mars. Maybe uh, maybe uh, maybe it's a lot easier to go to Mars if someone like um, can like uh, someone super smart can say, well, all we need to go to Mars is to develop this religion, and then uh, and then like ten years from now we'll go to Mars. Like uh, like, like can you <laughs> is that it, it is that feasible? Yeah, yeah. So the reason why religion is a powerful social technology is an evolutionary reason. It evolved into that power. It, it, it's the word we use to describe that evolutionary phenomena. There is an aesthetic power that moves humans in a communicative way, in a shared way. And we call that religion. And you asked about the word strenuous. I would say strenuous is something that is like, it moves you more than in the casual sense, strenuous in the opposition to casualness. It's not something that you're like, oh yeah, that's cool. It's something where you go, where your eyes light up and you, you feel a prickly sensation throughout your body, or you feel this deep devotion or these great hopes. These things move us. They move us to reach out to other people and they move us to say, hey, we need to work together on this because it's so important. It's our most, it's our most important aspirations. It's our most beautiful visions. It's, that's what strenuousness is. It's about those things. And if those things are experienced alone in a personal way, I would say that's maybe something like spirituality but when we share them with other people, and, and especially when we start to develop practices, rituals, and those rituals might be formal or they might be informal at first, or there might be both. Once we develop practices around those shared aesthetics, then we're working on religion. And you say, well, can somebody super intelligent um, formulate a religion that would help us achieve a goal? Like for example, going to Mars. And I, I think the answer to that is yes, potentially. But one of the important things about the aesthetic of religion is that it, it can only function as religion when it truly does reach into us, when it truly does inspire us and move us. So if it's false or fake or shallow or manipulative, it's going to fail ultimately. It might have some success. You know, we have these little cults that pop up here and there, and then they end up, you know, killing themselves because the UFO doesn't land at the right time or whatever. But to really function in the most powerful sense, religions have to align themselves with what actually does move real flesh and blood humans, which with what really does inspire us, with what really does make us you know powerful enough to propagate the ideas to advocate the ideas and that can be good or bad things right we can propagate some really terrible ideas with that religious impulse with that religious fervor with that religious strenuosity but we can also perpetuate and propagate beautiful ideas that can move us potentially to terraform the desert of utah into a place where now millions of people live. Now, Mormon, Mormons did that and it's a beautiful thing, but Mormons also did some not so beautiful things along the way. Like we didn't treat Native Americans in Utah particularly well. So, you know, 
these aesthetics are powerful. They do good things. Sometimes they do evil things. And we need to keep all of that in mind as we apply these aesthetics, as we cultivate these aesthetics and participate in them, that there's at, beyond the aesthetics, there are then ethical issues. And beyond the ethical issues, there's also epistemic things. There's real questions about what is actually true and false, right? What can we verify empirically? It's one thing to build an aesthetic around a supernatural being. It's another thing to talk about that supernatural being in a world that is permeated with scientific knowledge like we are today and expect people to take it seriously. If you describe your supernatural God in a way that runs contrary to the best of our science, you're not gonna get traction. You shouldn't get traction. And among educated persons, you won't get traction. So these things ultimately need to be aligned. The best of our science needs to align with the best of our ethics. And both of them need to align with the best of our religion, our aesthetics. And we need to share these with each other in ways that build each other up towards a beautiful human future. Because if we don't, somebody will use all of that power to create something very dark. That's, uh, that's a really interesting um, and, and optimistic um, view of how to do that. So, so I kind of, um, I kind of want to um, talk about, talk about Lincoln Cannon, like uh, you, you've got a very um, interesting and and unique uh, personality, and um, and and you're really um, well. You're really inspiring for me because uh, I'm just I'm just you're like a really really smart person that is really is really focused. And um, I heard it. I, I listened to an interview that that you did with an atheist, and and at the end of the interview, uh, the atheist said, uh, the atheist said, "Hey, Lincoln, um, can you?" Uh, I, I'd really like to have you back um, because I want to. I want to debate um, li like you versus um, like religion versus um, atheism, and um, and and you said something like, "Well, uh, uh, well, like um, my my paraphrase, um, like I'm, I like my paraphrase better, which is, oh, you um, you can, um, you can try to debate me, but I'm I'm like undebatable. But but, but that's uh, um, that, uh, that's not what you said. Uh, what what you said is actually. Um, it might not turn into a debate because uh, uh, because once we like like come up with like definitions, we might find that we agree on a lot more than uh, um, than we disagree on. And so uh, and so 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 what what might be the debate might might just be a discussion of like how we agree on a lot of stuff. Um, so so. So I think that's um, I think that's really uh, well, and, and all my interactions that I've had with you, you're you're a lot more about like building consensus than uh, than, than about like tearing tearing different people's um, tearing the different people's views down. And so 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 I'm wondering if you could talk about that, like like why is it your personality to um, to to take a opportunity to debate like religion versus uh, religion versus atheism, and then turn it into uh, uh, turn it into like, hey, well, this is what we agree on, versus uh, versus you like trying to win um, win an argument and 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 prove um, prove that atheism is false. Right. Yeah, I, I think there's a few answers to that question. Uh, one answer to that question comes from my reverence for Christianity and the way it informs my my ethical framework. I think the central act of Christianity is reconciliation and love. And I think that that should happen on all levels. I think we sh it should happen on an aesthetic level. It should happen on an on a, uh, ethical level and it should happen on an epistemic level. And so if I can find a way to speak to somebody else in the language that works for them, I have an obligation to do that on a religious level. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, my calling is to reconcile. And I take that very seriously at that level. I think that's what it is to be a disciple of Christ, is to work at reconciliation. Um, on, on another level, I think part of the reason I'm that way is that I was an atheist. I, you know, I grew up in a Mormon home uh, with, with uh, parents who were Mormons. My mother was a convert from Catholicism. And my father was a lifelong Mormon. And 
they taught me Mormonism from the time I was very young, but I was very analytically inclined and became rather skeptical of the religion over time and had lots of hard questions that I didn't get sufficiently good answers about. And as a young adult, I eventually became an atheist. But while I was an atheist, it might sound strange, I decided that I was going to do a very close study of the Bible. And I started reading some other things that started influencing me in a way that thoroughly persuaded me of the pragmatic value of Christianity at a time when I was an atheist. And subsequently, that attitude towards Christianity kind of opened my mind up to things that started influencing me in a way that I eventually regained my faith in God. And now I'm, I'm no longer an atheist, but for, a, for quite a few years in my, young, in my young adult life, I was an atheist. So I understand atheism and it doesn't frighten me and I don't think it's evil. It was essential to my own spiritual development. And I know it can be essential to the spiritual development of many people. And even if they don't ever become spiritual people or religious people per their definition of those words, that's okay. People need to go through what they need to go through. They, they believe what they believe. And yes, we can, we can work on our beliefs and try to change them, but that's a long process. You can't just choose right now what you're going to believe. You believe what you believe. And so people are where they are for a reason. And I think it's worth trying to understand that. And this of course gets back to the other reason, trying to understand it and reconciling with that. And then from, from that point, you know, especially for transhumanists or Mormons who are atheists, I can just share with them my experience and say, hey, listen, I know where you're at on this because I was there. Now, everybody's a little bit different, but I know a lot about this. And invariably, when I talk to people about it, we find common ground and then we can build from there. And maybe we won't build to exactly the same place. But my experience is that almost every time we leave with a great deal of respect about where each other is and much more agreement than disagreement. And more importantly, much more shared purpose. And so I, 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 have, I have friends who describe themselves as atheist Mormon transhumanists because they completely buy into the purpose of Mormon transhumanism. They just don't think God exists yet. And so, you know what, I disagree with them and I, and I have reasons why I think they're incorrect about not trusting in the existence of God. But that's less important to me, and I'm pretty sure it's less important to God than our shared purpose about making the world a better place, about making humans better people. And so I embrace that. If, if I can build a shared purpose with somebody else, I'm going to do it. And the founder of Mormonism, Joseph Smith, he once said something along these lines. If I can persuade them to believe in my way, I will. But if I can't, I'm going to build them up in their own way. And I think that's exactly right. I think that's a perfect demonstration of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, of a person who taught the primacy of love. We should be engaged with other people in this compassionate way where we take them seriously. We put ourselves in their position. We try to understand them. We tell them about ourselves too, because we also matter. We're not nihilists here. We're not gonna say that I don't matter, only you matter. No, I matter too, but you also matter. And I'm gonna tell you about myself. And if you don't like my approach to this, if I can find something in common with your approach, why should I not tell you so and work together on what we do have in common? So the short answer to your question is, I feel a religious duty to be that way. And then my own life experience has kind of shaped me to be oriented towards that because I've been there. Cool, and, um, and, and yeah, you're, um, you're, you're smart enough that you, you, you really could be like the Mormon Ben Shapiro, um, where, uh, where, where, where they're, they're like YouTube, YouTube clips, um, Lincoln Cannon destroys um, atheist. Um, so, um, so, so, so have you ever, let, 
like in your earlier days, were you ever, um, did, did you ever like, were, were you ever more like argumentative um, inclined than uh, before you, before you reached this point? Um, or, um, or, or, or have you always kind of been this way? Well, I, I actually enjoy a good argument in the non, in the non hostile sense. I like it when people will debate with me seriously. I, I actually don't mind that at all. It starts to become uncomfortable once hostility arises, which sometimes does, of course, when, when people feel strongly about things. And, and I try to not go there. I, um, I, I try to kind of like, when, when I sense that coming, um, and, and I'm not perfect, I, I contribute to that too. So when I sense that coming either from myself or the other person, I, I try to like back that off and, and re-situate re us into a more constructive approach to our discussion and our disagreement. But yeah, there, there have definitely been times when, when I've been angry and just decided I wanted to like lay into somebody about what I thought was a stupid idea. And, and that tends to be, that tend, there's two kinds of people that tend to eventually get me to that point where I, I, I'm not as patient as I would ideally always like to be. And those kinds of people are religious fundamentalists and anti-religious fundamentalists. People who are so dogmatically narrow-minded about a particular construction of religion, and they both are, dogmatically interested in either building up this very narrow sense of religion or tearing down this very narrow sense of religion that they can't communicate or think open-mindedly or broadly and they just want to be your enemy. And so when, when, I, when I get that sense and I, and I like, you know, and hopefully most of the time I've tried an alternative, alternative approach before going to this next step. But when I get that sense that, hey, listen, they just want to be my enemy. Sometimes, I, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll go there. And sometimes I'll like, like I have, a, I have a list on my blog of, I don't know, dozens, probably over a hundred quotes from various religious fundamentalists who have attacked me over the years that just show some of the horrible things that they've said about me. And I, and I published those on my blog because occasionally when inevitably some other religious fundamentalist comes along and tells me that I'm an evil Satan worshiper with the mark of the beast and my, my children are demons and whatever, um, inevitably they come along and they tell me, I say, hey, listen, I get it. I know you think that you're not the first person. Look at this long list. And if you're so lucky, I might even add you to the list. How do you feel about that? So I, some, sometimes I try to use a little bit of humor, but sometimes I'll actually push back and just say, hey, listen, what you're talking about now has negative social consequences, your demonization, or in the secular sense, your ridicule, it tears people down. It makes the world a worse place. What you're doing is wrong. And you might also be wrong about this topic in this way or this way. So, so yeah, sometimes I will, but that's not really what I'd like to do most of the time. <laughs> okay, it's, uh, it's good to know that you're um, human um, a little bit. Um, so so, um, so, so um, something, so, uh, something that I noticed is um, your, uh, what, uh, well, like, like the way they say you're supposed to answer questions is don't um, don't answer the question you were asked and answer the question that you uh, wish you were asked. But um, but but I've noticed um, I've noticed that um, that basically whenever somebody asks a question that you kind of um, think through okay they have this question this question and this question and then you go um, point by point and uh, like um, like like if if I were asked. Um, the pretty complicated questions that I'm asking you, then I would I, I would get totally lost in in answering them. I'm not I'm I'm not really well, well. I'm good if you give me a lot of time to organize a response, but um, but I'm I, I, I'm wondering why um, why when I why when you're asked questions you an, ask answer the question that you were asked and and um, not the question that you uh, wished you were asked. Sure. Probably because I, I, I guess I value that myself. When I ask somebody a question and they don't really answer it, I'm always left feeling, okay, fine. You talked about what interests you, but 
that's not what interested me because I asked a different question. And so I, I feel like if, if, I'm, if I'm disappointed when that happens, others probably are too. So I'm going to try to answer their questions in the same way that I would hope that they would answer me. And another, another thing that comes to mind, when I, when I was um, very young, when I was a teenager, when I was starting to become skeptical about my, my religious tradition, one of my biggest concerns was that people would get up in church and say things that, in my estimation, they didn't really know with way more confidence than they should have. And I told my dad that on one occasion, on one occasion after church, we, had, we were driving home from church. We stopped in the driveway of our home before going inside the house. And I said, dad, I think people are lying at church. <laughs> and, and I explained to him why. And, and um, my, my dad was great with stuff like that. He just listened to me and you know, let, me sh let me share my thoughts. And then I even turned it on him at the end of the conversation, I said, so dad, these people at church are claiming to know all these things. What do you know? And so I, I like put the spotlight on him and he answered my question directly. He said, well, I don't know a lot of things. And, and then he, he may have said a little bit more, but the, the, most, the most memorable part about what he said after that was, but I do feel like I know there's a God. And that was like the, that was what he wanted to communicate to me was his touch point, maybe, where he was most confident. And I was persuaded that he was being honest with me. Now, I was already starting to become, I wasn't yet an atheist at this point in this discussion, but I was on my way there, as it turns out, because years later, I would be an atheist. And, but, but, you know, may, maybe, maybe another answer to your question is that maybe that was modeled to me by my parents too. Um, maybe because of the way they answered questions, even hard ones, uh, to me, maybe I decided, hey, well, that, that was a good way. I liked that they directly answered the question to me when it seemed like other people really wouldn't. So I'm going to do the same thing. And I think a lot of us do that, right? We're, we're very shaped by the way our parents raise us. And I, I you know, I really think my parents did a, a good job raising me. You know, we, we didn't always see eye to eye on everything. My father's now dead. He died in at age 48 from cancer. And he, that was, what, 23 years ago now. But um, my, my mother's still alive. Got a great relationship with her. I love her dearly. But I, I, you know, I really value the way they raised me. And I think it influenced some of these characteristics that you're asking about. I think my religion um, also maybe influenced these. One of the foundational stories of Mormonism is that Joseph Smith was confused about religion. There were a lot of different religions that his family and friends were involved in. And he wanted to know per his account, which was true. And he read in the Bible, in the book of James, we were talking about the book of James earlier, where it says, hey, if you lack wisdom, ask, ask of God and God will give wisdom liberally. So per the story, per Joseph's narrative, he went into the woods to pray to God and he had a vision where God told him that none of the current religions were true as he described it at that point and that he would be involved in starting a new one or in restoring an old one, I guess, is the way that Joseph Smith put it, in restoring Christianity, um, or at least restoring what Joseph Smith came to understand as a better form or a truer form of Christianity. So, you know, that foundational idea that asking a question can lead to an answer. You know, I was grown up hearing that story about the founding prophet of my religion. And so that might also shape the way I feel about questions. I think questions are important. And I think especially hard questions are important and we should do our best to really answer them honestly. And when we do try to answer them honestly, I think people sense that and respect it. Cool, and that's, uh, that, uh, that's, kind, of a, uh, that's kind of a good lead into my next question, which is, um, uh, uh, which is, you mentioned that um, you mentioned the Mormons are very excited about sharing their belief with other um, people, and then you mentioned kind of by um, kind of by extension, then Mormon transhumanists are also excited about sharing uh, sharing information about Mormon transhumanism. 
And I've noticed, um, I've noticed a um, kind of a pattern with, um, with, with, um, uh, with you. And the, uh, uh, this is uh, this is my uh, this is my view of the of the Lincoln Canon uh, model for um, getting people excited about stuff. Is it, it is that I've noticed that when, when I've interacted with you, then that, then you, um, you you first spend a lot of time listening to me. Um, and and really um, r really giving me the feeling that you under that you understand me, um, then um, then like e um, even if I'm not um, even if I'm not asking a question, um, but like in here um, in this interview you've um, you you've done it through through answering questions, but, um, but 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 if we were talking and I was just telling about like well I I feel this I feel this I feel this, then I've noticed what you do is similar to what you've done in this interview is. Um, take take mental notes. Okay, um, this this this, and then um, and then you talk um, you you talk about those things. Um, you, you talk about those things that I uh, mentioned it when when I was talking, um, and then um, and then at, at at the very end you give a nice um, a nice invitation, a, a, a little a, a little pointed and um, and and like uh, like the invitation that you gave me before uh, before we started recording. Um, uh, 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 was kind of well. I'm not really sure how to describe it, but uh, but but my question is about the about that process. Um, so so if I'm a if I'm a Mormon trans uh, and, and well be, uh, before I before I um, before I get to the question, there's a lot of uh, with that model. There's a lot of stuff that can go wrong, um, and and a lot of people a lot, a lot of people don't execute that model um, well. Uh, but, like, like a lot of people try um, try try to do something like that, but either in the listening part, the uh, the sharing their own experience part, or in the invitation part, just kind of mess it up and um, and um, and 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 it just doesn't doesn't go well. Um, so and, and and actually, I um, one time I um, one time I um, I have I have a friend who's a Jehovah's Witness, and and she said, hey do, hey, do you want um, these folks to come over? And and I thought, oh yeah, because I have like I have lots of questions, and um, and this couple came over, and after like an hour and a half, I hadn't been able to ask one question. Uh, like, uh, like and, and my questions about Jehovah's Witnesses are like, uh, like, 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 like a lot of like technical stuff. Like, oh, well, how are how are you organized? Um, like, like who who print who who makes and prints the Watchtower? Um, like, um, like, uh, like those were the kind of questions. But, but like, I, um, I, I listened to them for an hour and a half, got zero zero answers, and I think they were um, they were ready they were ready to be there for like six more hours, but. Uh, but 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 finally, I just I realized I'm not going to get any of my any of my questions answered. So I so I kind of gracefully kicked them out and never never invited them back. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, uh, so anyway, I, I'm sure not all Jehovah's Witnesses are like that. Um, but um, but 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 I think this model that you use um, um, or uh, uh, this model that you use, you, you you've got a lot of uh, you you do it very very well. And I'm wondering, like, um, can you go through all of the points and explain, like, how someone can um, how someone can do it, um, like you, like non annoyingly? Because um, because like everyone has examples of someone that tried to do the model, and I'm sure this um, I'm sure this guy that was uh, that was talking to me, like like I'm sure that that's what he he was probably thinking. Hey, well, I'm doing this, but uh, but 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 from my experience, absolutely that um, he um, he wasn't. And so 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 I'm wondering, like, why. Uh, like, like why you, why you're able to do it and so many other people um, aren't. Yeah, for the record, there are people who do find me annoying. I'm glad you don't. Um, why, why does it work? I, I, I think, I think oh, and, that. And, and, and can you also, um, can you also tell me if I, um, if I got the model right or not? Um, like is that an accurate sure. way of describing I guess it, in my head it's not a model but yeah I mean the way you described it that does that does sound like an accurate characterization of ways I often interact with people uh, maybe part of the reason it works is that I'm not thinking about it as I do that it might be kind of naturally part of of how maybe I've felt successful in my interactions with people historically but uh, 
also, I, I think that it may stem, a couple things come to mind. It may stem from a place of genuine interest. You and I right now, we're talking about something that I love, right? And you are asking questions about topics that I love. And I'm happy to, to share my answers about these things and to attempt to persuade you and your audience that these are ideas worth entertaining and worth respecting and maybe ideas worth participating in. So I mean, I, I love it. And I think that when somebody loves something that shines through, I think it generally shines through and that, that sometimes we get in our own way by not just going there and just deciding, hey, I'm gonna say what I think and I'm gonna share what I feel with this person who's asking me a question about something that matters to me. So I think genuineness can help. Another thing that came to mind though, is that what, one of the things that all Mormon missionaries are taught to do, and I was a Mormon missionary, I served a two year mission in France, is, and, and this is taught in a very formal way and that with the intention that hopefully it becomes natural eventually, but for many Mormon missionaries, it seems very robotic or insincere because it probably is robotic and insincere in their cases, or at least at first, maybe always in some cases. And that is that a Mormon missionary is taught that you should build a relationship with somebody before you start trying to teach them anything. Because without a relationship, people just tend not to care about you. They tend to ignore you. And the relationship has to be genuine. And this is where the robotic part comes in. A lot of people don't know how to make a genuine relationship with somebody because maybe they've encountered somebody whose interests are so alien that they're just not able to connect or whatever. But the, the first thing that a Mormon missionary is taught to do is build a relationship of trust. And then that, that relationship of trust can eventually lead to a situation where questions can be asked and answered. And so then there's this process of teaching or advocating or, or questioning and answering that goes on. And then Mormon missionaries are taught that the final part of a conversation should be an invitation of some sort. Um, like you pointed out. So it's very similar to the model that you just pointed out. And when you were pointing this out, I, it came to mind that what you were describing sounds very much like what Mormon missionaries are taught and like what I was taught as a Mormon missionary. And I don't know, to be completely honest, um, how pervasively that instruction may have influenced my standard approach to talking about religion and philosophy and politics and sexuality and everything possible controversial because it does have potential for being an effective method. But as you've also pointed out, some people don't execute it well. So um, how is it that it executes successfully for me? Well, A, I'm not trying to execute it. That, that's not what's going through my head when these things happen. But it may be that what I'm doing mostly naturally at this point is to some significant extent, and I don't know how much, it would be, it'd be interesting to reflect on that, influenced by formal training in an approach that approximates what you described. Yeah, that's, uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's, that's interesting because you, uh, you definitely have a much more, uh, much, much more refined um, approach than, uh, than the average uh, Mormon, uh, Mormon missionary. But I think you're, uh, you also have the benefit of of um, many years after your um, after your mission to, um, to 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 apply it in um, in a bunch of various situations too. So so I think we're about out of time, but I have um, I have two more questions. Um, um, uh, may, uh, maybe they're quick. Um, so so the first question is uh, you you mentioned uh, you mentioned the vision of transforming. Uh, transforming the earth into uh, it, it, into basically a paradise, and um, and and like and like us 
us basically being the ones that are um, doing doing the transformation. So, so, so my first question is if if we can if we can do it to the um, to to whatever the image that conjured in my head of like like, like a paradise. If we can change that, then then stuff like terraforming Mars or like even terraforming Venus, which should be really hard to terraform, um, th th those should be pretty easy in comparison to transforming. Uh, the Earth into into a paradise, I would guess. Um, so, so that's my first question: is your is your thoughts on that? And then, um, and then the um, the other the, uh, the other thing I noticed about you is that um, if if you Google Lincoln Cannon, then um, then only um, only results for Lincoln Cannon come up. So Lincoln Cannon, Lincoln Cannon, Lincoln Cannon, Lincoln Cannon, and and like nobody uh, no uh, nobody else. Uh, nobody else that I um, have ever Googled has that many results about about themselves. Like, uh, uh, like, like just for um, just just a test, I, I Googled Robert Downey because I was like, oh, sure, um, surely, um, surely he has, um, sure, um, um, surely, um, surely he has um, like like twenty out of the top twenty results. But 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 actually, you have to uh, you have to go to result number twenty um, to find information about the Lincoln Cannon that's in like like Nebraska or somewhere. Um, it, it's some like canon in in this war war museum or something like that. So um, so, so my second question is like how um, how did you get so good at SEO or, or like 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 what's uh, what, what what's what, what's the technique of getting um, of getting your um, uh, you being so visible with that? Yeah. So the first question about how expansive could heaven be? As you pointed out the you know, I, I've only talked so far about this idea that Earth becomes heaven, but what about other planets and, you know, maybe other star systems or galaxies or whatever? There's a, there, I, I think he was Russian philosopher whose name was Kardashev, who talked about this idea of a Kardashev scale. And it was this idea that um, an intelligent civilization should be able to harness the computational capacity of its proximity in increasingly powerful ways. And he divided, he stratified the potential of harnessing computational power into multiple levels. And so you might imagine, you know, in science fiction, people call this computronium, the idea of turning matter into computational power. So um, you might imagine that we become so good at building computers that eventually our entire planet is, is capable of running computations. And, and you might think, well, that sounds weird. I'm not talking about turning it into a desktop computer. Already, for example, we can, do, we can make DNA perform computations in living bodies. We can already do that. So just imagine if we were able to convert the entire planet into computronium. And then, um, so, I, if I remember correctly, he, he called that would be a, a Kardashev level one civilization when an intelligent civilization harnesses all of the computational power of its planet. And then he said a Kardashev level two civilization would be one that harnesses all of the computational capacity of its star system. And there are among transhumanists this idea that we might be able to create what's called a Dyson sphere. And a Dyson sphere would go all the way around a star and harness all of the energy of the star and use it for computational power. And then I, there is a Kardashev level three civilization, which would harness all of the computational capacity of a galaxy. And the way we might imagine that, and I, I'm speculating wildly here, but not without some grounding in, in uh, fringe physics, um, there's this idea that maybe black holes are actually little baby galaxy, baby universes. There's a physicist named Lee Smolin who has this um, idea of fecund universes where black holes make baby universes. And what's interesting about that is that black holes make things really dense and dense environments are really potentially great for computation. So maybe these Kardashev level three civilizations look like black holes or something like that. Compu computized, instrumented black holes. Bringing this back to Mormonism for a second, in Mormonism, there is an idea that there are multiple kinds of heaven. 
multiple levels of heaven. And that the um, most common or mundane form of heaven, if you want to call it that, is a telestial heaven. That's what our scriptures call it. And that earth is an example of a telestial heaven presently. But that the day will come when the earth will become a terrestrial heaven, the next level, and eventually earth will become a celestial heaven. And uh, the prophet Joseph Smith associated the idea of a celestial heaven as being symbolized by the sun, the glory of the sun. So there are a number of Mormon transhumanists who like to think that when we become a Kardashev level two civilization, and we're harnessing all the power of our star system, that that's what Joseph Smith loosely had in mind or envisioned in his, uh, in his dreams, in his prophecies, in his revelations, when he talked about earth eventually becoming a celestial glory. So um, in, in Mormon scripture, there's a passage of scripture where it says, all of the inhabitants of the celestial world or the celestial glory that's likened to the sun will eventually receive white stones, Joseph Smith called them, into which they can look and they can learn about glories of yet higher orders. So maybe that celestial heaven that the earth becomes isn't the end of the story. Maybe we still need to go on and become a Kardashev level three civilization at some point. Anyway, some fun speculation there. Of course, the only thing I know for sure about that speculation is that I'm wrong to some extent. Um, your second question then, oh shoot, remind me of your second question. Um, my second question is about um, Googling Lincoln Cannon. Oh, yes, SEO. Um, I think there's two answers to that question. Number one, um, my name is relatively unique. So it makes it easier than somebody who's named, for example, Joseph Smith. That would be a lot harder to own the first 20 search results for the name Joseph Smith. Um, Lincoln Cannon is you know, not a common name. There are other Lincoln Cannons, as you found out, around, but it, there's not many of them. Uh, but secondarily, uh, one of the businesses I run is a business that does marketing technology for people, um, technical marketing. And one of the things we do for our clients is search engine optimization. So I actually am good at search engine optimization on a professional level. And that has um, that skill is something that I honed in part over the years as I tried to get my message out about my um, philosophy and my views, uh, my aspirations and my interest in sharing those ideas with other people as effectively as possible. Uh, so, so yes, I've used formal search engine optimization techniques to further my missionary efforts. And I don't <laughs> apologize for that. Cool, cool. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, when, when I Googled Lincoln Cannon, I was like, whoa, whoa. Um, so, um, somebody, um, somebody, and I think it was Lincoln, um, did an awesome job with uh, with this. So, um, so, so yeah, that was cool. So, um, so anything um, uh, before we wrap up? Anything that um, any like final final message or 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 anything that we didn't um, didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about? I guess I'll just throw out there an invitation to anybody who wants to participate in Mormon transhumanism because now I now I have to follow through on the method that you said that I follow. <laughs> now I'm now I'm doing it consciously. Um, the MTA actually has monthly online meetups right now because of the pandemic, they're all online. So anybody who watches this, who is interested in learning more about Mormon transhumanism, they're invited to join. They can come, um, you can come, that you and they can come together. And um, we, ha we have various topics from month to month and everybody's free to either just listen or to participate and ask questions. There's often lots of back and forth. We talk about all kinds of wild topics ranging from the kinds of things that we talked about today, like cryonics and singularity, uh, to religious topics um, about, you know, you know, why is Jesus Christ important in religious transhumanism? Or um, what is the importance of our religion in, um, in regards to social justice issues? Or uh, how can we be better people and better stewards of the environment? Or uh, what's, what are our thoughts on machine intelligence um, and ethics of it? All of these kinds of things and more we talk about as Mormon transhumanists. We bring in a transhumanist angle, we bring in a Mormon angle, and it's a, it's a rather ecumenical Mormon angle. Uh, we, we, um, Mormon transhumanists tend 
to believe that pretty much all religions have value to some extent or another. We love our religion, of course. We're Mormons for a reason, but we tend to be open-minded and we tend to be willing to acknowledge that, hey, somebody else from this other religion has something valuable to bring and to share. And guess what? They can probably help me be a better person too. So let's listen and share that. So if, if that interests you or anybody who watches this, you're invited. Cool, and you've, uh, you've, mentioned, you've mentioned at one point that 25% uh, of Mormon transhumanists aren't actually Mormon, is, is that accurate? And the, and, yeah, so, and the... yeah, so like 75% of the members of the Mormon Transhumanist Association are also members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is the largest Mormon denomination. Then a small percentage of the other member, well, a significant percentage of the remaining are members of other Mormon groups besides that um, largest Mormon church, such as the Community of Christ or um, smaller organizations. And then there are also people who are members of the Mormon Transhumanist Association who aren't Mormon at all, but who support the purpose of the association, like what we do, like to participate, and they are always more than welcome. And it's funny, like I said, we have atheist members who like to say that they're atheists because they just think God doesn't quite exist yet, that eventually God will exist because we will become God, which is a very Mormon idea. Although most Mormons would say, yeah, but God also exists already for, for various reasons. Anyway, atheists are welcome. Um, other religious people from other traditions, we have Buddhist members. Uh, we have uh, members of other Christian traditions like um, mainline Protestants and Catholics and um, Uni Unitarian Universalists that are members. And then, like I said, most of us really are Mormons and care about our tradition. And there's various forms of Mormons. Like some of us are more practicing than others. Some of us are more faithful than others. Some of us are more believing than others. It's really a, quite a diverse group. And that diversity is embraced and accepted. And uh, most of the time we do a good job of navigating it in constructive ways. Cool. That's uh, that's uh, uh, that's really awesome. And 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 um, the uh, the meeting that I went to, or or the meetings, I can't remember if I went to one or two. Um, it it was just a really nice, welcoming um, environment for and and really respectful of like whatever point you're at or whatever your belief is. So uh, um, so um, see, so, so yeah, I can I I can second um, what you're what you're saying about that. So so thank you um, thank you so much. This has been a really really um, interesting discussion, and I I. Um, I, I really like all the really cool detail that you uh, that you gave on all that. So um, and and thanks for um, thanks for answering all of my uh, every single one of my questions. So that was that was really really cool. So um, so so thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. I, I really appreciated the opportunity. So thanks for the invitation.